All right, if I may uh, have your attention, please. Uh, my name is Don Newman. I am the chairman of the advisory board of Canada 2020. And it is my pleasure and uh, honor to in welcome you all here this evening and to uh, say that I think that we are in for a very lucky evening. Uh, Canada 2020 was formed in 2006 by uh, three, three people, one of whom I want to identify tonight, Susan Smith, who is down here in the uh, front table. <laughs> and by Tim Barber and uh, Tom Pitfield, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight, but uh, I have been around since about 2010 as the chairman, and they do all the hard work, and I take as much credit as I can, which is I understand what the chairman is meant to do, and uh, not do much work, but just the credit, and uh, they do all the hard work. Uh, one of the things we are doing this year is Canada in the Digital Future, and uh, this dinner we are calling that, but what a better way to do uh, Canada in the Digital Future than uh, to have uh, with us tonight many of the members of the Global Commi Commission on Internet Governance. And they, of course, have been brought to us by another group, which is the Center for International Government Innovation, which is in Waterloo, and which is uh, a very important group in Canada. And we thank them for bringing to us the Global Commission on Internet Governance to make this the kind of important evening uh, that it is tonight. Now, uh, CG is one of our partners. The Government of Canada, the Department of Foreign Affairs, is one of our partners. And I want to show you, though, on the screen because nothing happens without our sponsors. And without our sponsors, our sustaining sponsors, who every year cough up so we can hold a number of events and produce papers and research documents, uh, those are our sustaining sponsors. Some other people give us money for specific events, but those are our sustaining sponsors, and we uh, are very grateful to them. Now, uh, the other thing that... Uh, I want to thank is MediaCo. MediaCo are a partner of ours in live streaming our events, and they are doing it again tonight, and so uh, they are also a very important partner with us, along with CG and with the Foreign Affairs Department. I want to uh, present to you first, if I may, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Canada. John Baird was elected to the federal parliament in 2004. He became a member of the cabinet when the Conservative Party took office in 2006, and in 2011 he became the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, as such, he is the voice of Canada around the world, and we are very lucky to have him with us tonight. And I would ask Mr. Baird to come to the podium, and Mr. Baird to um, give us some remarks, but also to make a very important presentation. Well, thank you very much, Don. It is a tremendous uh, privilege for me to be here uh, on such uh, an auspicious occasion uh, run by uh, Canada 2020, which is quickly emerging as uh, a key bridge and interlocutor uh, for ideas and uh, voices, and uh, we welcome their, uh, their uh, addition to the space in the Canadian public policy and Canadian politics. It's uh, also for me a personal honour to be uh, here to uh, speak on such a very a serious gathering of people. Uh, of course, that's not to say that the House of Commons is not a serious gathering. I am, uh, but I'm uh, pretty sure that if we somehow connected uh, all of the brains in here and applied them to one challenge, absolutely phenomenal things could be accomplished. Thanks to Canada 2020 for helping make tonight happen, and of course, CGI, CIGI and Chatham House for their support of the Global Commission on Internet Governance. It so happens that we do have a great challenge Ahead. Guider le Canada et le monde vers un futur numérique garantissant liberté, droits humains, prospérité et sécurité n'est pas un défi simple. Personne n'aura pu prédire l'immense portée de l'Internet et son impact dans nos vies. Comme la majorité des Canadiens et quelques 3 milliards d'individus autour du monde, je me repose sur l'Internet. Je m'en sens vers pour diminuer en, concours, en contact avec mes amis, pour partager les idées avec mes collègues, effectuer les transactions bancaires, publier des tweets et 
pour lire l'actualité. Mais l'impact et le potentiel de l'Internet est maintenant l'un tout autre niveau que ce que avant, nous avons pu voir jusqu'au présent. The Internet is driving economic growth. It spurs innovation. It has quickened the pace of globalization. I don't need to preach to the choir here. It's also a tremendously powerful tool to promote freedom of the individual. If you look back historically when communication relied on the speed of a horse or a ship, families and communities were relatively autonomous. Then, over the last couple of centuries, railways and telegraph lines crisscrossed our nations. This enabled faster communication and information and therefore more centralized control and bureaucratic coordination. The internet will go down in history as a genuinely game-changing technology because it has driven power back down the pyramid to the mass of users. Talking about the power of the internet is not a new subject, but frankly, we still don't know how it will continue to radically shape the way humans interact with one another. Anyone can communicate with anyone else and access the same information at the same time. We've seen the fundamental assumptions of industry, industry after industry being challenged by this phenomenal change. Just look at how the mainstream media, the previous gatekeepers of information, are now having to reinvent themselves. This new openness is tremendously exciting. It's what makes the internet such a powerful tool for political change and just as importantly for economic growth. Protecting it as an important human rights issue because it empowers individuals by creating space for dialogue and giving voice to the voiceless. This is, sorry for me, for this to continue, we all bear, we all bear some responsibility for keeping the internet free, open and secure. This all sounds very nice and agreeable. But be in no doubt, while we see openness as a virtue, unfortunately others see it as a threat. The more people are empowered, the more some people feel being disempowered. So, like any powerful invention, the internet can be a double-edged sword. Don't forget the research that created the internet in the first place was driven at first by military objectives. Everyone in this room uses the internet for positive ends, to advocate your point of view or simply to sell your product. But others are harnessing the latest cyber technologies to suppress activism, to quash dissent, and to silence criticism. Human rights are about individual freedoms, governments that deny their citizens these rights and freedoms in conventional, analog ways are now busy trying to do so digitally. These governments fundamentally fear free expression. They fear the power of new ideas and new thinking. They fear, at the heart of it, they fear their own citizens. And so, these governments are trying to repudiate long-held international norms, all in the name of security, all in the name of fear. In other words, tool, tools for freedom are being to, turned into tools of repression. Just look at what's happening. Look at what's happening right now, today, in the Russian Federation. The seemingly anonymous green men that we've seen in Crimea and throughout eastern Ukraine have their online equivalents. President Putin has accelerated restrictions on the internet and has brought on a full-on crackdown on media and, unfortunately, on opposition voices. Russia's SORM system allows the Russian secret police to monitor all web and telephone activity throughout the country at a whim. Such governments forget that freedom of expression, that freedom of assembly, is not a source of insecurity. It's actually what keeps democracies secure. Civil liberties can be safeguarded even as we safeguard societies at the same time. That's what the Government of Canada believes. We are steadfast in our conviction about a simple principle that human rights should be enjoyed just as much online as they should offline. 
And when it comes to the internet, privacy is the foundation for the enjoyment of so many, of so many other rights. At the same time, people expect governments and businesses to understand their needs. The key then, simply put, is trust. Governments and businesses need to demonstrate that they can earn and keep that trust. It is this approach that distinguishes us from the, the approach taken by repressive regimes. Just as freedom and openness are essential to securing democracy, so is improved security essential to preserving freedom and openness. We know that many governments are trying to control and limit their citizens' use of the internet, that they're also trying to explore the source of threats affecting Canadians, our companies, and just as importantly, our national security. We need to tackle these security threats by taking concrete action to improve our own defenses and those of our allies and major trading partners. Cybersecurity is a threat, not just to governments, but to consumers and to businesses. We need to deny cyber criminals the cyber equivalent of safe havens from which to operate. We are working to do just that by providing support to countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to prevent, to monitor, and to respond to security threats related to cyberspace. We must also be vigilant of the radicalization to violence that is happening online in our communities and in our schools. In the last few years, Canada has invested more than $10 million in innovative research to learn about the recruitment methods and tactics of terrorists, including how the internet is used for such purposes. We are working to protect rights abroad, too. That's why we've been providing training to citizen journalists and to activists in places like Syria, Egypt, Azerbaijan, on how to safely use connection technologies. In some countries, Canada is engaging in what we call digital diplomacy with non-state civic and political actors, including online influencers, to help them affect positive political change where they live. Canada's support for the global dialogue on the future of Iran is an important example of how we can engage directly with people themselves. Although we, although we don't have an embassy in Iran, the global dialogue social media platforms have created space for Iranians to share information that their government has sought to filter and to block. It's been a huge success with over 4.5 million unique users who have accessed these platforms from inside Iran. And we intend to roll this out approach, that roll out this approach one step further. These are some of the ways we can and are working to mitigate the threats of the internet right now. To do this in the long term, we must ensure that the internet's future is determined not just by governments, but also by the private sector and just importantly, by civil society. Now, I like speaking in a plain and direct way. So let's be honest. Multi-stakeholder internet governance is not the snappiest or sexiest of titles. <laughs> Though you're doing a great job in promoting it, Carl. <laughs> but it's exactly what we need to preserve if we are going to ensure that the internet remains innovative, free, open, and just as importantly, for the benefit of all users. When you think about it, there's something truly special and unifying about the open internet model that we enjoy today. And right now, we're at a crossroads between, between a universal approach or a balkanized one, between the internet or the so-called splinternet. Worryingly, the same governments who already use the internet for repression are some of the biggest proponents of changing this model for their own ends. This issue can be sound technical, but its impact is absolutely immense. It's huge. In politics, we try to explain that if you care about your taxes and the public services that you use, that you should get out and vote for the government that you want. It's the same principle here. If you care about the day-to-day -day users of the internet, the uses of the internet, if you care about Internet governance, it's important. 
if you want to ensure that the Internet remains an open platform for economic growth and for free expression, then you should care just as much about Internet governance. That goes for those of you from the private sector as well. After all, much of the infrastructure for the Internet and most of the services it provides is actually in your hands. In this globalizing world, an Internet with unhindered communication is an absolute essential investment for the private sector. Booming markets require a free flow of information across borders. It's estimated that every 10% increase in Internet penetration leads to a 1% boost to GDP. Businesses also have a responsibility, an important responsibility, to protect their consumers and the rights of those customers. They must resist efforts by authoritarian regimes to curtail online freedoms. And governments and civil society must help the private sector in achieving these important goals. So I've talked about some of the work that's been done so far, but there's only so much that we can achieve as a government and even as a nation. That's why Canada is tremendously committed to working with our international partners to ensure that the internet is kept open, safe, and accessible. We are a founding member of the Freedom Online Coalition. This is a strong partnership of countries promoting internet freedom, and I was very proud to represent Canada at their first ministerial meeting in Tallinn last May. We also look forward to our continuing work with our honoured guest, Carl Bildt, as chair of the Global Commission on Internet Governance. The Global Commission does tremendously important work in providing a high-level strategic vision for Internet governance. So we were more than happy to host the Commission in Ottawa today. No one should be surprised that Carl Bildt was chosen to lead this important challenge. Under his capable and dedicated leadership, the Government of Sweden has led the charge in advocating for human rights and for freedom and it must be protected both online and offline. Carl has also innovatively pursued how freedom and openness on the Internet can promote economic and social development worldwide. Not only that, but he has been nothing short of a digital maverick as an early advocate of digital diplomacy and an avid user of social media. And that's something we're going to be focusing on further in the work done tomorrow. Now, I'm a big fan of Carl's. Sometimes his tweets are very blunt and tremendously interesting. I remember one example just a few weeks ago during a phase of increased European and Canadian American sanctions against Russia. He dryingly noted how strange it was that Belarus, a landlocked country, was suddenly importing and exporting huge amounts of smoked salmon. Now that he's no longer constrained by political minders and diplomatic obligations, I'm sure his tweets will become even more interesting. Ultimately, though, ultimately Carl believes strongly in a free, open Internet and in ensuring that the voices of people around the world can be heard no matter the intentions of their government. And it's this work that I would like to recognize further today. And we've got an important video to explain why. I am a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship God in my own way, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I believe wrong, free to choose those who shall govern my country, this heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and all mankind. John Diefenbaker had a strong instinct for protecting the underdog. His determination to secure rights for all led to the passage of the Canadian Bill of Rights and the appointment of the first woman cabinet minister. He also appointed the first Aboriginal senator and secured the right for all Aboriginal people to vote. On the world stage, Diefenbaker spoke out at the Commonwealth against apartheid and took a strong stance against the encroachment of Soviet communism. 
Le prix John Diefenbaker pour la défense des droits de la personne et de la liberté a été nommé en l'honneur du 13e premier ministre du Canada. Il rend hommage aux personnes et aux groupes qui font preuve d'un courage et d'un leadership exceptionnel dans la défense des droits de la personne de par le monde. All freedoms are rooted in the inherent dignity of human beings. Whether the issue is religious freedom, sexual freedom, political freedom, or any other freedom, some people ask, what business is it of ours? What interest do we have in events outside of our borders? Well, our business is a shared humanity. Our interest is the dignity of humankind. Les principes que John Diefenbaker s'est employé à faire respecter constituent le pilier de la politique étrangère du Canada. Canada has been a relentless advocate of human rights in all corners of the world and will continue to take that stand. Since 2011, the Diefenbaker Award has recognized the work of Reverend Benjamin H. Yoon from the Citizens Alliance for North Korean Human Rights de Madame Asma Jahangir, une avocate et militante pakistanaise, the late Shabazz Bhatti, Pakistan's former federal minister for minorities, de Madame Susanna Trimarco, militante argentine et fondatrice de la Fondation Maria de Los Angeles, His Eminence Cardinal Joseph Zen, Bishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, Her Royal Highness Princess Mabel Van Oronya, Dr. Ashok Dialchan, and Amina Henga on behalf of the organization Girls Not Brides. Today, we are here to honor people who share Canada's founding values of respect for freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present the John Diefenbaker Defender of Human Rights and Freedom Award to Carl Bildt. As you, as you have seen, this award recognizes those who have demonstrated exceptional courage and leadership in defending human rights and freedom around the world. Carl is working to ensure that citizens the world over are free and able to express their views with strong and provocative words if they so desire without retaliation. This is the essence of freedom, the essence of democracy, and the very essence of his important work. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage for the presentation, Carl Belt of Sweden. Thank you very much. It goes uh, fairly obvious that I'm uh, deeply honored uh, to uh, receive this uh, distinguished award from the government of Canada and to uh, receive it also from my old friend John Baird. We've been working together on, during my time as foreign or our, during our mutual time as foreign ministers on X numbers of different issues. And that has been very natural to do because there is a natural community in some sort of way between you Canadians and us Vikings the one way or the other. Um, you might know, of course, that uh, the Vikings arrived in what later turned out to be Canada well before that famous Spaniard or Italian or whatever it was <laughs> ended up by mistake in the Caribbean. Um, why the Vikings? The Vikings were good people in a number of respects, but they did have their faults, and one of them was that they, for some reason, left Canada and went home. But uh, now we are, in that sense, back. Um, we are united, as said, by our two countries, by quite a number of different values. 
Um, and that has been demonstrated also in the way in which we, as uh, foreign policy actors, have been acting together on different issues throughout the world. But today, the issue is uh, the question of uh, the development that we see related to primarily the internet. And for all that's been happening with the internet, I always make the point that we ain't seen the beginning yet. This is just the beginning of what is a profound technological revolution, which is going to have profound economic, social, and political consequences for the better for all of our societies and throughout the world. But it is dependent upon us preserving the values that have been the strength of our societies, of the communities, and of the nations of the free world. And to put it very, very simple, you can say that in a situation where obviously mankind is moving online, we must not leave freedoms offline. And there are governments that want to do that. Governments and regimes that are sort of reluctantly or somewhat happy to embrace the technology, but wants to use also the technology to limit the freedoms of their citizens and of their societies and of their economies. John indicated some of these, and we can go on. There are degrees to them. Some are worse than others but there are quite a number of offenders around the world, and the number of offenders have been increasing. And that is why it's so important that there are governments, Canada, Sweden, the countries united in the Freedom Online Coalition, that stand up for these values and that are ready to defend that the same freedoms that we cherish offline, that they should be protected online. This is important, needless to say, from the political point of view, from the point of view of human rights. But we should not forget how important it is overall to the development of societies. The innovation potential of the net holds the key to the future of a lot that is going to happen in our societies. And without freedom, innovation is simply not going to happen. So it is important for the innovation potential of all of our societies, and accordingly also for the economic and social development of our societies. It is human rights, certainly, that's the basis, but it is far more than that. And we must also be aware of some of the dangers that might be there in terms of the privacy and the protection and the respect of the individuals. Some decades ago, there was the fear that uh, the new technologies was going to lead us into a 1984 to take the famous Aldous Huxley novel. That did not happen. But that does not mean that the risks are not there. We avoided a 1984, but we must avoid a 2084. And that is dependent upon us defending the values and the principles. And that is dependent upon there being in this world of ours also governments uh, that, and ministers that are ready to stand up also when it is sometimes somewhat inconvenient. So I was happy as Minister of Foreign Affairs of my country to take the initiatives on some of these issues, be that in the uh, Human Rights Council of the United Nations, or be that with the Stockholm Internet Forum, or be that in the Freedom Online Coalition. We have a new government in Sweden. I'm quite convinced that they will carry this particular torch forward. But even more important, I think, is that this torch is carried forward also by other governments and other ministers around the world. So um, I'm honored, I'm pleased, I'm happy with the award, but I'm equally happy with the words of John Baird and how the government of Canada will now be staunch defenders on of the freedoms uh, online in much the same way, or in exactly the same way, as Canada has been a staunch defender throughout the decades of the freedoms offline. Thank you very much. I'm honored. I will continue to work in the spirit of this award. Thanks.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rohinton Medor, and I'm the president of CG, and I have the pleasant task uh, at this point of bringing this portion of the evening to an end with a few words of thanks. Uh, thank you to Canada 2020 for having organized this event and provided us the opportunity to amplify the issues around the internet governance subject and to recognize Carl Bildt's uh, signal achievements in the areas of human rights and freedom. Uh, thank you to our commissioners on the Global Commission uh, for Internet Governance who come from around the world and represent diverse fields of expertise and diverse viewpoints and are giving us their time to help us think through this important subject at a time, as the minister and as Minister Bilt noted, um, the internet is at a crossroads. Uh, thank you especially then to Carl Bilt for agreeing to chair the commission and marshal these quite interesting, diverse viewpoints and to bring them together into something that by the end of next year will be, uh, we are sure, a coherent and uh, respectable set of, uh, of principles that will help us guide an internet that helps us achieve all the potential that we know that this technology has. And last and absolutely not least, uh, thank you to Minister Baird and the Government of Canada for hosting the Commission here in Ottawa. We've had a fruitful two days of discussion. Uh, we appreciate the hospitality and the support but perhaps more importantly, we appreciate the interest and the engagement that you have shown in this subject, because that's what spurs us on. Uh, the whole point of a commission like this is to know that important and thoughtful people are listening and are interested in this work. And so CG and Ch Chatham House, who have co-sponsored the commission, re really owe you uh, a great vote of thanks. So thank you for that. And to all of you, um, thank you for joining this evening, and bon appétit.